It just seems that whenever there's a woman or a person of color in these positions, there's always this filter of, oh, they're corrupt. Mainstream media loves to talk about, you know, what smoke somebody threw at someone on Twitter. At the end of the day, voters and constituents, residents, all of us, we want to know, hey, are these elected officials working? The new ranked choice voting system did enhance the ability of the election to feature diversity. This was an opportunity for everyone to throw their hand in the ring. It's all coming up on the Laura Flanders Show, the place where the people who say it can't be done take a back seat to the people who are doing it. Welcome. Hi, I'm Laura. Welcome to the show. This week, our monthly Meet the BIPOC Press with Sarah Lomax-Reese and Mitra Kalita, co-founders of URL Media. They're our monthly partners for this segment that looks at how BIPOC media cover things and people differently. This time, how do black candidates running for office get covered in more complex and better ways when the reporters reporting on them share their background. Sarah, over to you. Thanks, Laura. Hi, I'm Sarah Lomax-Reese, and I'm the president and CEO of WURD Radio and co-founder of URL Media, a network of black and brown owned media organizations. Today, we're going to talk about the New York mayoral election. Eric Adams is currently the Brooklyn Borough president. He was declared the winner of the Democratic primary in July. He's the most moderate of the large slate of candidates who ran, and he's also a former police officer who was beaten by cops at age 15. So he's not easily categorized. So we're gonna talk about the, the New York results today and the national implications and how we cover increasing racial polarization in the political landscape. Today, we have three guests, Felipe de la Hose, an independent journalist who covered this election for URL Media, Charles Ellison, who's the host of Reality Check, a political and public affairs show on WURD Radio, Julissa Ferreres Copeland, who was once a city council person, and she made history herself as the first Latina elected from Queens, and she's now a consultant. Mitra, why don't you take it away? Thanks, Sarah. Indeed, this was such an important election. And for the first time, URL Media actually had a shared reporter to cover this race because so many of the issues that New Yorkers decided in the primary um, are certainly resonating nationally as well. Um, so I'm going to start with Felipe, who was URL Media's reporter for the elections. Felipe, I'm just wondering if you could talk a little bit about your approach to coverage of the race, as well as what surprised you. What uh, surprised me really is in my conversations with voters that I had on early voting days and I had uh, on election day itself, the new ranked choice voting system uh, really seemed to be something that people grasped intuitively. It's something that you know hasn't really been much of a, a part of you know American elections, where it's the biggest municipality by far to have instituted a ranked choice voting system. And I think people kind of understood innately why it helped them express their preferences a little bit better you know, why it was, you know, a good thing, a good experiment, even though it's being hotly debated now, post-election, I think most people kind of grasped the, the idea behind it in the first place. I wonder if it's possible to just zoom out a little bit on the issue of ranked choice voting to just explain it. And also, um, you talked about the number of candidates uh, who ran in New York City, which follows the national trend of, uh, you know, a record number of candidates running for office, in some cases, dozens of candidates uh, for one seat. Does that, is it because of ranked choice voting? And does that make the field more diverse? Yeah, sure. So definitely, um, so ranked choice voting for this was sort of a runaway of it. Uh, it's essentially a system where instead of you know, you having a slate of candidates, candidate A, B, C, and you vote for one of them and your vote goes only to that one person, you essentially rank them by preference. So your first choice will be candidate A, your second choice could be candidate B, your third choice could be candidate C, and you're essentially voting for all of them in layers, right? So if the, the, the one of those candidates is eliminated because they did not get enough votes in one round, the votes, your votes go to the next candidate that you rank. So that your votes aren't sort of quote unquote wasted if you're voting for someone who doesn't ultimately, you know, win the election or who doesn't have much of a chance, uh, and that's the idea is kind of to be able to express your voter preferences better uh, through that. And so, you know, in this particular election cycle, it was uh, fascinating that we had 
frankly, you know, hundreds of candidates because we had the vast majority of the city council was actually um, open. There were no incumbents because most of them had been term limited out. And so we had, you know, sometimes a dozen or more candidates in one particular um, in one particular city council election. And I think that, that you know, it did uh, enhance uh, the ability of, the, you know, the, um, the election to feature diversity, to, to sort of have communities better represented um, because it was sort of a, a once in a, in a decade almost, right, opportunity, you know, because it's very difficult to defeat incumbents. So once you have somebody in, you know, you're probably going to have them in for eight years or so. And so this was sort of an opportunity for everyone to throw their hat in the ring. Charles, I wanted to, to go to you to kind of zoom out even more in, in terms of looking at what um, Eric Adams's election in New York City, a very progressive city and a progressive state, um, blue city, blue state. Um, but Eric Adams is, is a pretty law and order. He's a, he's a complex character, but he's also very, um, he's not the, the most progressive of the slate that, that, uh, that ran. You know, Eric Adams' rise uh, in this particular election took a lot of people by surprise because there was just a miscalculation as there always is, <laughs> you know, whether it's a state, local or federal race, there's always this miscalculation or these misguided assumptions about, you know, what's on the minds of black voters and even some brown voters as well. Uh, black voters are very pragmatic, practical, because I think that there was this assumption that black voters kind of neatly fix into this progressive voter box. Now, nah, black voters are very pragmatic and they're about survival. And also black voters live in neighborhoods, whether it's low income to moderate income, and they want, they deserve a high standard of living and a high quality of life. And they want safe neighborhoods too. They want to live in the same kind of safe neighborhoods that say like white suburban voters live in. And so when there are spikes in violent crime, uh, we need to pay attention to that. And we need to address those concerns and those needs and not just think that, oh, we're just gonna neatly tuck you away. You can go over here with college educated white liberal progressive voters or middle income white liberal progressive suburban voters. And you guys are all on the same page about these issues and that may not be the case. So um, on that complexity, Jalissa, I wanted to turn to you. You uh, were the, as, as Sarah mentioned, you made some history yourself as the first Latina elected from Queens. This is pre AOC and, you know, many people say your election paved the way for about a half dozen Latina candidates that now represent that area. Um, you've since left the city council. I just wondered, um, if you could talk a little bit about what Charles is alluding to, this balance of uh, being tough on crime, but still being uh, scrutinous of the police and police brutality, is that balance possible? Um, and I, I think there's some other dynamics at play as well that I know you've talked about with us on the Epicenter podcast um, pretty recently. The reality is that people want to be safe. One of the things that I believe really helped Eric Adam towards the end of the election was the uptick in crime and the fact that people weren't understanding exactly why this was happening. And when, you know, the statements like defund the police, how you explain that to a 65 year old grandmother who's like, wait a minute, I don't want to defund the police. I want the police in my neighborhood. I just don't want the police to harass my grandson and kill, you know, my son. So there's, we can hold these two thoughts. And I think that is very evident in the results of this election. The other thing that I wanted to touch upon, and this is really interesting because when I first got elected in 2009 and when I worked for, um, the council member prior to that, and Eric was in office at the time, you know, we were the progressives. So also kind of the progressive line has moved. So it's like, you're not progressive enough. Eric was known as part of the progressive movement. I was a progressive just because I was the first Latina, you know, an Afro Latina. And then as a finance chair, right? Everything was like, oh, we've never had a progressive. Then AOC comes like a lightning rod and the entire progressive movement or what we stand for moves. And I think that that is a transition that we're also seeing and many established Democrat you know, young people that were breaking barriers and doing things were considered progressive just, you know, eight years ago. 
Um, so I think that many voters already, especially those that voted for Eric in Brooklyn, already viewed him as someone who had fought against the police. While he was a police officer, he wasn't going with kind of the mainstream and going with the movement. Um, and I also think that ranked choice voting helped Eric and helped um, the uh, the other candidates, right? Because it also gave people more flexibility to say, okay, I'm not 100% on any on all his points, but maybe I'll make him my number two. Um, or, you know, and some of the women in the race, which also is really important. I know Felipe mentioned this, um, ranked choice voting and where we are now, and even in the progressive movement, allowing more women's voices to be heard was very important in this election. I think it's evident when historically we'll have, you know, it might look like 30 women out of 51 in the council. You mentioned there was a progressive wing and then it moved even further to the left. We know from the last few years that mainstream media doesn't necessarily cover nuance that well. How do you think Eric Adams should be covered? There's been some folks, uh, certainly on progressive Twitter that allude to, you know, he's so corrupt. There've been some headlines uh, where there's, you know, a photo of Eric Adams, you know, second African-American uh, mayor of New York City with headlines that kind of allude to, um, you know, the company he keeps or how does he really work? Can, can, how, how should we uh, balance this going forward? And then I'd love the others to jump in as well. Well, you know, as someone who was also um, often followed by the press, right? Because as finance chair, it's it's interesting that as people of color, we always have to have kind of this filter of, you know, watch them, you know, do they really know what they're doing? And I think it's really disheartening. Um, and actually, if we're, you know, all I believe journalists need to be fair. You know, I'm not asking anybody to romanticize uh, this moment but we must be fair and balanced. The reality is that, you know, he's going to be our mayor and we have to give him an opportunity to do things right. We, you know, this assumption that he's gonna be cor corrupt, he hasn't even been sworn in, right? Um, and he was the borough president. This was an issue when he was borough president. He was a state senator. This wasn't an issue when he was a state senator. Um, and, you know, it just seems that whenever there's a woman or a person of color, in particular a person of color, in these positions, there's always this filter of, oh, they're corrupt, or, you know, and, and of course, I think politics, right, politicians in general are viewed, um, it's very few that are viewed as, oh, you're going to come in there and you're going to make change, but, you know, we need to be balanced in, in our reporting, and I think when you kind of go into really the, the nitty gritty of how things, you know, I for lack of a better word, but how the sausage is made, right? Some journalists, unfortunately, would call me and say, you know, essentially would want me to write the article for them. And, and I think that that is not something that we're used to, right? Journalists usually were investigative and put, you know, and put the work in. Um, and unfortunately, there's some journalists that don't believe that. So it's easy to tweet and say, oh, this is going to be corrupt because they heard it from somewhere else. I just, I want to throw this to, to Charles and then Felipe could talk about your, you know, this, this question around accountability and journalism and how we hold our electeds, whether they're black and brown or not accountable to the communities that they serve? Journalism has this very irksome, irritating habit of, uh, of being, you know, sort of political gossip platforms. And so I think we, we have an opportunity here, and I think Black media could be leaders in this. Because uh, if you notice one thing that I try not to do, uh, like with, with my program, Every Day on Word, Sarah, is I try not to get too much into political gossip. Like, oh, did you hear what they said? Did you see what scandal they were caught up in or what they did. I want to know about the policy making. So I think we need to pivot from, you know, sort of getting caught up in the melee of what someone said or some scandal or, you know, what they were caught doing red handed. And I think we need to get into more reporting that's 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 focused on the governance and saying, OK, d what what bill are they working on that's going to improve my quality of life? Did this legislation that they passed or did this appropriation that they made um, or that they were able to finally push through, um, did this substantially improve uh, socioeconomic conditions in my neighborhood? Voters and constituents, residents, all of us, we want to know, hey, are these elected officials working? I think we're way past the stage where it's like, oh, a new black elected official. OK, so he's the second black mayor of New York City. 
that's it's not a novelty anymore to have black mayors. So let's you know. So so on, on another level too, while you're holding them accountable, or black communities, black media are holding them accountable as black elected officials. Don't look at this as novel. Don't look at them as historic celebrities anymore. No, they're public servants. They're there to serve. Are they governing well? How are they responding to navigating and fixing and solving these crises? Okay, I was just going to um, turn to Felipe. I wanted to just ask you, as you covered this, this uh, mayoral election for URL and had to navigate all of these candidates, all of these complexities, um, how were you able to approach this these these issues in ways that were both uh, you know um, interesting and compelling, but also very much about outcomes and and impact for the people on the ground. There, you know, there was a time not that long ago, right, where you know DNA info was at every community board, and the, the, the New York Daily News had twice as many reporters as it does now and whatnot. And so, unfortunately, a byproduct of that too is that <clears throat> you know you you have fewer people stretched more thin and it's just easier to do, you know, kind of trend pieces about, you know, what people are saying about a, you know, a particular politician on Twitter. You know, and so far as kind of the coverage of, of Adams going forward, I think there are a couple things too that just to sort of consider, right? Uh, you know, I think that there are layers here that, that are involved with, you know, questioning him because he, you know, he's a, a, a black elected official, you know, a person of color. But I, but I also think that, you know, his campaign on occasion kind of took that as a way to, to try to squirrel out of some, you know, legitimate questions. I mean, the whole thing about whether he lived or did not live in New York, really, like, frankly, a, a bit of a ridiculous premise in the first place. And, and, and I don't think that they were necessarily able to you know, engage with that question in a way that, you know, many reporters found satisfying, right? The tour of his apartment where, I mean, it really seemed to be his son's apartment and things like that. I mean, I, you know, I'm not going to say that that definitely that was the case or whatnot, but I think that there were some things here, you know, where, uh, you know, he did try to kind of pivot and say that, oh, you know, you wouldn't be asking these questions of a, you know, of a white elected official or something. And I don't necessarily think that's true. And I hope that they'll avoid, you know, some of that, um, you know, some of that one when, when, you know, if and when he's mayor, you know, he's got to win the general, but I don't think Curtis Slew was going <laughs> to defeat him, frankly. Um, so I think a big open question is how he's going to handle, um, you know, public safety, right? He's both a former police officer and a, a former police reformer, right? So he kind of has his foot in both sides here. You know, we have to remember that the last black mayor, the, the first one, David Dinkins, was defeated by Rudy Giuliani in part on a campaign of you know, claiming that he was basically anti-police and that, you know, he was going to, he was letting the city slide into to anarchy. And, and, and that was an extremely racially tinged campaign. And so, you know, I think we have to be keeping an eye out for, for similar things happening going forward. You know, if, if Mayor Eric Adams does try to institute police reforms and, you know, tries to kind of rein in some NYPD abuses and whatnot, you know, I think we really have to be sensitive to whether you know certain outlets or other political figures start to kind of go down that same track, right, and, and, and claim that oh, you know, he's, you know, he just hates the police, and 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 you know, there, there's a very racial dimension to that. So I, you know, that's something I do think that we, as reporters, also have to be very wary of, kind of. Going. I just wanted to get your thoughts, Sarah, on where some of these stories run matters as much as the story itself. So you've said to me, you know, when word for example, holds a black politician accountable or has a discussion um, around crime in let's say black neighborhoods, it's a very different tone than say the Philadelphia Inquirer or you know, the New York Times. Um, tell me a little bit about what you mean. Sure, yeah, I mean, context matters. Um, you know, we saw this when we were dealing, when Barack Obama was, was the president, um, there was such a, a, a tension and such a, a conflict, I think, for the Black community in general um, around this question of interrogating and holding Ob Obama accountable for things that we didn't necessarily think were in the best interest of the Black community, but also feeling like we needed to protect him because he was the first Black president and he was getting taken apart by so many other places in the media and, and we didn't want to pile on. And so I think that having conversations that are contextualized that are specifically within um, a, a media community that is serving a specific community like, like WURD, we have a black audience. 
And so we can talk about things, whether it's about police brutality and community violence in ways that are nuanced, that, that do hold both of those things at the same time and don't sacrifice, we, you, you can't be um, <clears throat> against, the, against police brutality and against community violence. We, you know, a lot of times there are these false narratives that if you talk about one, you're dismissing the other, but in spaces that are specifically culturally um, targeted like WURD, like the media outlets that URL is, um, is serving and it, you're able to have authentic, culturally relevant, culturally specific conversations with, within, it's almost like a family conversation as opposed to if the Inquirer, like you said, Mitra, if the Inquirer, the New York Times or the Washington Post had probably the identical conversation, it would be seen and viewed and consumed very differently by uh, communities of color, by the black community, because it would be perceived as, as we are being um, looked at from out from the outside, as opposed to having a conversation that's organic and within and for and about. We've gone from pretty much all white male electeds to uh, Latinas, and we're about to have our first South Asian elected. And so, um, Julissa, I, you know, COVID was supposed to be, uh, in some ways, like this was going to be the COVID election. It ended up being much more on law and order and crime. I just wondered if you could bridge um, those two themes a little bit for us because uh, your family, uh, like mine, is, is in the epicenter as well. But you've also talked a lot about law and order not being a monolith in terms of a, a voting issue for the Latino community. Yeah, you know, uh, as a product of Corona, it just happens to be called Corona Queens, which was the epicenter of the coronavirus. Um, our communities were devastated. And what the virus did was it not only, you know, unfortunately, many people died of this virus, right? But the reality is that it created these food insecurities like we had never experienced ever. You know, so people weren't, you're trying to live and eat, right, and have access to food. And also many of the people that live in our just in, in my former district are also essential workers, right? So it was layer upon layer upon layer of just crisis at a, at a, a level that we had never seen in particular. Um, the reality is that traditionally voters, um, the, the electorate or the, the um, politicians or the elected officials never paid attention to us because it is an undocumented population. You know, we want to have access to food. We want to have a hospital that's going to provide services when needed. Um, we want to protect our neighbors, the diversity. There's a, about 133 languages spoken in between the two zip codes of Jackson Heights and Corona. So you talk about diversity, that is what, you know, we live that. So I think the, the, the immigrant influence also is important because um, many people didn't believe that Latinos would come out to vote. And people forget we've been doing a lot of work on US citizenship and helping people become United States citizens. So the Latino vote is a very different vote from those that have lived in the community 50 plus years. The Latino votes, you know, you have to find that thousand dollars and take that test and learn a little bit of English and do all these steps to even have that right to vote. So a Latino voter will vote very, um, thoughtfully because they've thought for they they've been fighting and waiting for this opportunity for five plus years so we are um, going to get ready to kind of wrap things up it's been such a wonderful conversation that we've we've examined a lot of different areas Mitra do you want to close us out I would love to I think um, one area that we've kind of talked around is the diversity of the electorate uh, but one thing to look for in 2022 is the diversity of the electeds. So I think certainly in the swing states, uh, Michigan, Pennsylvania, North Carolina, Georgia, uh, we've written a lot about the immigrant vote, but I think um, seeing um, people of color in office in 2022 is another trend uh, to look out for, which as in the case of New York City, we will have our, most likely our second African-American mayor um, elected in November in Eric Adams. Um, it's been a really, really smart, thoughtful discussion. I'm so grateful to all of you for being with us. 
Who we hear from matters. It sounds obvious, but the truth of that was brought home to me again as I watched the first day of Congress's select committee investigation into the events of January 6th. We have heard for months that enough has been done. There's been a congressional investigation. Hundreds of the participants have been prosecuted for riot. There have also been those who said it wasn't a riot at all, but simply a peaceful protest. Well, I believe that hearing from the four officers who addressed the commission will make a difference. It may not change everybody's mind, but hearing Harry Dunn talk about how hard it was to be there and ask directly, why is it so hard to tell the truth in America? I think that will make a difference. I think it will be heard. My only question now is, will it be remembered what else he said? That he asked, does my vote count? For The Laura Flanders Show, thanks for joining me. Stay kind, stay curious. Till the next time, and thanks. For more on this episode and other forward-thinking content, and to tune in to our podcast, visit our website at lauraflanders.org and follow us on social media at The LF Show. 